This is a first. Thank you to the development office for putting this together. It's wonderful. And uh, I'm going to moderate the career panel. And um, we have three fabulous alumni who are here now today. And I'll introduce everybody individually. But first, we have Ryan Dawes. And I'll give you a whole bio in just a second for everybody. Kelly LaRue and Christopher Signalfi. So let's just start off with a round of applause for them coming. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. So they were all here at the uh, MDI Bio Lab, just like all of you. And uh, they have stories to tell. They've had careers beyond that. And it's all about uh, getting some feedback from them about where they've been, how life has progressed. And we're really hoping, we, we do have some questions here prepared for our panel, but we really want students in particular, but anyone in the room, to chime in with their own questions uh, to try and help people figure out what might be best for them. So I'll, I'll begin with a, a brief introduction of each one of you guys, and then um, I'll give you a chance individually to then just say whatever you'd like to say a little bit about um, whatever you have in mind, and then we'll get into the Q&A after that. So we'll do that one at a time. So we'll start with Ryan. And I didn't memorize all this, so I'm going to read to you. Right. Feels a little awkward as a teacher to read so much, but Ryan uh, Dawes is a native of Belgrade, Maine. He received his bachelor's degree of science in biology from the University of Maine in 2011. During the summer of his junior year, he received an Embry Network uh, fellowship to study synaptic plasticity in the Cricket Auditory System in the lab of Dr. Hadley Horch at Bowdoin College. That's uh, Eleanor's talk today. Is Eleanor here? I don't know. Hi, Eleanor. So you guys are in the same lab. Currently, he is pursuing... Good choice. <laughs> Pretty neato. Uh, currently, he's pursuing a PhD in neuroscience at the, in the lab of Dr. Edward Brown at the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. His dissertation work centers on identifying the mechanisms through which psychological... Yeah, stress can alter the growth and progression of breast cancer. Yeah, so with that, I'll let you just let the audience know anything that you would like to. Um, I think you kind of covered everything. I mean, I was here for the summer, but I had been at the University of Maine uh, for a couple of years doing research. Um, Sharon Ashworth is actually here. I just spoke with her. So um, uh, I'd be happy to talk to anybody uh, here or afterwards about what currently it's like to be in grad school and try to offer any sort of insight. Uh, but feel free to toss any questions at me. Yeah, thank you for that because I, I want to not forget to mention that right after this, we're going to have a, a cocktail hour. And of course, our guests will be here. So whatever doesn't get answered right here and now, we can hopefully get to some of that stuff there. Um, okay, so let's introduce Kelly LaRue. So Dr. Kelly LaRue is an MDIBL alumna from the summer of 2008. She studied the tissue distribution of sodium hydrogen exchangers in minnows and sculpin under the instruction of one of our board members, Dr. J.B. Claiborne. She completed her undergraduate degree in biochemistry and molecular biology at Dickinson College in 2009. She then pursued a PhD in molecular biology at Princeton and defended her thesis about a novel mechanism of coordination in fruit fly courtship song duets in uh, February 2015. Just a little while ago. In March, she returned to MDI as the genomic education specialist within courses and conferences at the Jackson Laboratory. So she knows our Charlie Ray and our Mike McKernan really well. Yes, I do. Really good friends of ours. Um, okay, so Kelly, would you like to just let them know anything in particular before we get to the specific questions, or? Um, well, I. Uh, also went to graduate school, so if you guys have any, any questions about that, and we, we were just talking previously before we started, and we have very different experiences from graduate school, so we could offer you know, some, some different perspective on that. Um, I guess, I, I mean, I think my bio covered it, but I'm originally from New Jersey, so I'm not a Maine native, but I loved it so much here in my summer that I just had to come back. So that's why I was, uh, you know, I have a job at Jack's now, and uh, I was just trying to find any way to come back here after, after I had spent the summer here. Yeah, that rings true. I think a lot of us do that. <laughs> okay, so Christopher, Christopher Signalfi 
Uh, he graduated at the University of Pennsylvania with a BA in philosophy, politics, and economics, and is also a CFA charter holder. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a senior vice president and equity research analyst covering diversified natural gas companies and energy for Jefferies LLC. Prior to joining Jefferies in May 2013, Chris spent seven years as a member of the UBS energy research team. From 2006 to 2009, Chris helped launch UBS coverage of the U.S. coal sector and in 2010 transitioned to focus solely on natural gas related companies. Since 2010, Chris has been covering the integrated and regulated natural gas sector, uh, master limited partnerships, and the natural gas liquid market. Would you like to say anything? Yeah, that, so I wasn't really clear my bio uh, didn't interface at all with my time at UBS, uh, sorry, my, my time at MDIBL. Um, so I spent four summers here working with Dr. Epstein and Dr. Silva. Uh, on occasion, Dr. Hayes as well. Uh, we were working on uh, the rectal gland of the, of the dogfish shark, um, looking at different uh, chloride secretion inhibitors over that time. Um, I'm also from Maine originally, uh, grew up in Brewer, uh, just down the road, and found my way to the lab via uh, a, a state program called Merits that was a main educational research internships for teachers and students. So I was fortunate enough through that program to be randomly placed uh, here at the lab and with Dr. Epstein and Dr. Silva, who I hit it off with, uh, and they invited me back for several summers. I guess relative to the other panelists, I, I obviously did not pursue um, either graduate school or a career in science or, or medicine. Uh, I still work in research, but it's an investment research. Um, so I work covering uh, companies and making recommendations about their, their stock. So different, but obviously still an analytical process. Um, still have to publish my findings. Still have to defend them on a uh, daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> so I can speak to those students in the room who, who maybe enjoyed the time here, enjoyed science as, as, a, as an exercise, but maybe didn't want to necessarily make that a career path. So um, can help out anyway in that regard. Thank you, that's excellent. So I'm gonna open it up to questions right off the bat. Rather than using our prepared questions, Jane Disney would love to have the first question. <laughs> Ms. Disney. <laughs> um, well, it wasn't a quick decision because it took six years of graduate school to make that decision. Um, but basically while I was in graduate school, you know, my time here, I absolutely loved the research. Um, I loved being a part of the research community. And when I got to graduate school after doing all the interviews and all that kind of stuff, I realized that um, my life wasn't all about research. I needed some other balance and something else to focus on. So um, my friends and I actually started an outreach organization at Princeton completely run by graduate students and our apartment gave us a little bit of money to have fun with. Um, and so through that we've basically, we basically created a monster where every year all of the new incoming students want to be a part of it. So we had to organize new events and by the end of my term there we had like over 25 outreach events in a year. Um, also doing our research as well. And I found that really brought balance to my life and I really liked interacting um, with kids or high school students or teachers or parents, everybody. And so I just kind of saw that being a part of my career. Um, and then when it came down to it to make a decision on where I want to get a job next, um, I, I decided that education was the way to go. And I didn't know what that meant or what that would look like. You know, Jack's uh, working there has been awesome so far, but it is still my first job. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolving process, and, but, I, but I know that education, I'll always have it be a part of my career. I'll piggyback off of that question for just a second because of my interest in education. Um, Ryan, uh, you, you did some work at Bowdoin, right? But you uh, were also at the University of Maine. So a big institution and a small liberal arts institution. You've got experience in both. And you're working on your PhD now in neuroscience at Rochester. So have you been thinking about what Kelly thought about during those six years in the PhD? Education, hardcore research, where are you with that? Uh, 
Uh, so I'm planning on sticking in research, at least for now. So I'm still I'm in my fifth year of grad school. Um, so I, I have still been enjoying time in lab, uh, and I want to do a postdoc after I finish up. So I'll hopefully be finishing up in about a year, um, and looking to stay within biomedical research. Um, I'm trying to stay flexible with that. Uh, and I think people should and be open to new opportunities. Uh, but for now, yeah, stay, staying in the uh, academic research route, maybe biomedical, uh, biotech company research. Okay. Other questions? One generic one? Oh, okay. George, Albert, go ahead. I, well, I think the process is is obviously what gets ingrained here. Um, sort of the the purity of it in our lab, um, and also the discussion as to why we were doing what we were doing. I know that my my four years here were part of a, I think in Dr. Epstein's case, maybe a 40-year um, career at this laboratory, and so I was sort of a little a little snippet into a much broader uh, pursuit of of answers. Um, but I thought that, I think the process that they that they instilled in me and and the other uh, members of our lab were really important. I also think that it helped greatly. I was here um, my final two years of high school and my first two years of college, and I think being surrounded by people like Dr. Epstein and Dr. Siller who were so accomplished in their field fields, um, but interacting with them on a daily basis and seeing them just as regular guys you know, having very candid conversations about family and politics and life. Um, it sort of broke down a barrier for me when I was suddenly going from Brewer High School to the University of Pennsylvania and interacting with people who per perhaps at times put on airs about themselves, uh, were sort of crowded uh, with distinction, um, either self-imposed or from, from, from accomplishment. <laughs> And it, and it helped sort of, it helped me very much normal. So the academic part was really important, but I think the other aspects of the lab that I really have taken away is that you can have people, and I think those two, are, those two guys are perfect examples of this, who are very accomplished in their fields, um, but who are very down to earth, very uh, approachable. And, it, and that made me recognize that either professors I was dealing with at school or guest lecturers, or even in my own career uh, on Wall Street, you know, people that have a reputation it helps me look through that reputation and speak to them just flatly as, as I would anybody else. So that was a part of the lab takeaway for me that, that's really, I've carried on in other, you know, in the other pursuits of life that I think can't be under, understated. I don't know how you guys felt about your lab experiences in that regard, but that was a big deal for me. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and also thank you, Albert. I think everyone should know that Albert George is here. He's also an alumni of, of the lab, and he's here with his mentor, John Forrest. And so, Albert, you'll be around later tonight as well. If people want to talk to Albert, he's, he's running the conservation um, portion of the South Carolina Aquarium right now. So, awesome. Jerry has a question. Like for science. 
scientists and why funding is so critical, all of those things. It's yeah, ab I do, absolutely. My, my brother actually took a slightly opposite tact of me. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I first was here at the laboratory, and part of the reason that I studied philosophy and political sciences because I also had no idea in college what I wanted to do. <laughs> and that's about as broad as a discipline as I could make it. Um, you know, he, my brother went to Bowdoin College and, and he started, he was an economics major and then realized after school that he wanted to be a doctor. So he moved out to Utah and he worked in the Huntsman Cancer Center for a couple years doing lab experience, or I guess getting lab, lab experience. Um, and so he's now a physician and talking with him about things that he's seeing. Um, he doesn't do uh, any research anymore. He's, he's a, uh, in residency. But talking with him about that, I think, and then t I didn't mean to blow off the analytical uh, elements of the last question, but you know, in investment research, it's starting, obviously our, our experiments here at the lab were started with a question, right? Or elements that had been refined through the years that Dr. Silva and Dr. Epstein had worked on a, on a common problem. And it sort of ruled out certain elements of it. We were pursuing sort of the next frontier of that question. Um, when I, you know, in, in my investment research, I think one of the things that's very important and we try and stay grounded in is that we can't have a view going in. There's an overarching um, incentive sometimes to data mine, to do things that um, support an internal view that, you know, sort of in my gut, I think, I, I think it's going to work this way. Um, Jerry, and I think that time at the laboratory helps me resist doing that and being very fair and non-emotional about what we're doing. Um, I think unlike experiments in a laboratory, my current job is, is a lot of interacting with individuals, you know, individuals that are running companies or making financial decisions about companies. And so there's a human element to what I'm trying to analyze now that maybe isn't existing in a pure lab, you know, pure science form. Uh, but the same approach can be taken, you know, I. I very much like this guy or I very much don't like this guy. Um, but I have to neutralize those, those emotional feelings and just try and interpret what they're telling me. And I think that is what I've taken away from the lab that sort of transcends true science maybe, but is still an element daily for what I do. I think when, when I was here, the, the, the first thing I sort of took away is the rigor and robustness to science because I had had some internships before, but it was in more applied sciences than, than research. Um, so now in terms of, you know, obviously I've, I've gone through the PhD process and I know the rigor it takes to, to get a PhD, but looking at other fields that I don't really know about either, I would be as, as novice to them as you are to, to any of us. Um, you still understand the amount of time and the meticulousness that it, that it took to get those results and to convince the community and the people that this is real. So I think here was, that, was my first sort of look into that. You know, it was just a couple months in the summer, but you understand that, you know, the project that you're doing is such a small piece of a larger picture. And, and, and that's really what I, what, what I took away from, from this summer scientifically. I think that's the, both, of, both of you have touched on this, but the transferability of skills within, that you learn within science. I mean, fundamentally you have to learn to be able to uh, take in information, dissect it, and actually then turn it into meaning, and then convey that through effective communication. And that's something you have to do regardless of the career path you go down. Um, and even interpersonally, if you're unable to convince someone of your point of view or at least try to sway them, uh, you're going to have a little bit of a rougher time in life. Uh, so I think that the uh, skills you learn while you're doing research, while you're in grad school, those are uh, infinitely applicable to other aspects of the world around you. Question? I was wondering, uh, as a parent, what kind of doubts you came in with in the first days, and what kind of character development uh, did you have to overcome uh, as a result of those doubts? Or what character development traits did you have? Uh, uh, do you want to go? I don't care. Um. <laughs> Well, I, I think there was, I mentioned the intimidation factor and the fact that I sort of lost that over time having uh, experience here at the laboratory. I mean, coming, coming in my first summer, I had been a lifeguard the summer before that. I was a sophomore, or I was a junior in college, or junior in high school, sorry. And the lab is populated, 
I, I assume the population is still consistent with this, but by a lot of people um, who were in college who were pursuing, you know, pre-med backgrounds or hard science backgrounds um, from some of the top tier colleges in the country. And so there was a real, I think, question in my head from day one as to why, you know, what, what can I contribute uh, to this effort? Um, and I, th I think the mentorship I got from my two principals, but also from the broader lab community was really instructive. I think the other students that were here were helpful in that. Um, I also think the, uh, the notion that it's not all about the work you're doing, you know, that, that you're in the midst of one of the most beautiful geographic places in the world, um, and that the people in my laboratory over the four summers I was here, you know, wanted fully to take advantage of that as well. So there was also, from day one, but consistent throughout the time, this, this notion that, you know, we can work really hard on these issues in a collective, collaborative effort, but at the same time, why don't we get off the lab property? Why don't we take advantage of Acadia National Park, take advantage of MDI, have a good time, um, and build friendship as much as we do sort of uh, collegial at atmosphere within the lab? I think that was also really important. So it was very balanced in that regard. And I'm not sure during, you know, during formative years that's really important, I think, but it's probably always really important. And in my current capacity, I find people are way too tilted um, sometimes towards this being, you know, the work being the end all be all at the, ex at the expense of interpersonal relations, uh, corporate culture, things like that. I think the lab had a really, really good culture around incubating some of the people that were coming in like me with no experience, really nothing to offer. And hopefully by the time I left, I, you know, I was doing that for the people, sort of in a cycle fashion, doing that for the people walking in. So I don't know what your, your child has experienced this summer. I'm sure you guys will follow up on that afterwards. But that's, that was my time. Um, I think something I took away. I'd also like to present the same question. Yeah. Um, so I remember my, or at least my parents tell me, because I've blocked this from my memory, that um, I was miserable my first week here because, uh, you know, you're coming in, you're, you're just meeting new people, you're not sure who your friends are going to be yet, and you constantly, I feel like in science especially, you have this imposter syndrome, you know, the how, how can I contribute? You look at everybody around you and how brilliant they are and you're like, I, I'm nothing compared to these people. So definitely within that first week, I was experiencing that, and then once I started making friends, you know, talking to lots of people, actually working in the lab, you start to build that confidence. And I feel like that, you know, that carries throughout um, your scientific career, that every sort of step you make, you feel that over and over again. So it's sort of like preparing yourself for, for that to come. Um, and also, I really learned about myself as, as to how I interact in a large group of, of people. Um, you know, even though I was miserable my first week, supposedly, by the end of the summer, all my friends were calling me Alpha because I was the one that was like, today we're going to the gym and today we're going on a hike. And like, so I really sort of took control of the group. And so you, you just like college, you learn so much about yourself from being here and being separated from your normal environment as to who, who you become as a person. Uh, I'd like to echo what Kelly just mentioned about imposter syndrome, and that is an incredibly common thing. And for those who don't know what that is, uh, it's when you uh, are new to a new organization or a new institution, you feel as though you do not belong there when actually you are a distillation of a large group of people. You're well skilled, you're well educated, uh, but you don't feel like you belong. And that happens to, like, it's the majority of grad students, it's a lot of undergraduates as they enter labs. And that's here. And I don't know a lot of what's going on, but it's an opportunity to learn. And that's incredibly difficult, and uh, I still struggle with that. So when you go to a conference and you're surrounded by very intelligent people that have been working on a field for 30 years, uh, you feel a little bit like a fish out of water. Uh, and to be able to say, no, I need to take this and learn from those people uh, and take away what I can, and I will be better for that. That's, I think, the biggest, uh, that was the biggest hurdle for me. <laughs> um, so, um, graduate school is laborious. There's a, I mean, you're going to kind of get out of it what you're going to put into it. 
That being said, you will go insane if you don't have a personal life and you have something else um, to balance your life with. And Kelly mentioned having balance. Um, I've been able to, I'm engaged now, I'm getting married in October, so I've been able to, you know, go down a path of, you know, personal advancement too. Um, and I think that, <laughs> you know, I hope. Um, but um, it's important to be able to say what you're trying to get out of grad school. Um, if you look at grad school as this monolithic challenge that you must charge through as quickly as possible, it's, you know, it will be a, a headache a lot. Um, there will always be people there that will, tr uh, that will have more experience than you, uh, but that's a good thing. Um, and you'll be able to learn from them. And you could always work more, but don't. You need to be able to say, um, I, these are the goals that I have. I'm trying to stay organized and uh, approach this problem and this research question. Uh, but at the end of the day, I need to go home. I need to turn on Netflix and just you know hang out for a little bit. Because you, I think it's in those moments of peace and quiet that you start having interesting ideas. Uh, if you're in the trenches just doing your fourth Western blot that week and you're really just kind of blurring eyes, uh, you're not thinking about uh, the greater aspects of your project, and it's the times that you let your mind expand that that's when you actually start having true insights. Um, I feel like graduate school, in terms of time spent in the lab, is really dynamic. Um, it, it depends on what sort of program you've entered into. Uh, for me, I did a, a, at Princeton, they have sort of an umbrella program where the first year everybody's taking basically the same classes. You're just rotating through labs. And then in your second year, you choose the lab that you're going to do your thesis in. So um, the first year, you're still kind of in school. You know, They let you take all the same breaks that everybody else does. You're there for class. You have to do homework at night. But like you get to go home and, and pretty much have your same schedule that you did in college. Um, once you choose a lab, that changes. Uh, most of the time, you have to do uh, qualifying exams in your second year. Um, and that's just like straight out insanity for a good couple months where you do nothing but study and practice. Um, and then, uh, you know, in, in, at Princeton, we always called it the third year slump. You know, after you get through your qualifying exams, you're like, oh, I can breathe. And then you can take some time to do some things for yourself. And then once your fourth and fifth year start coming along, you start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and you will do anything to get there. So that's when you really start pushing yourself to get done. And it's really no one's, imp well, some PIs will impose time constraints on you, but really you're doing this for yourself um, and you have to make that decision of when that balance starts and stops. You know, if, if, you, if you need to go home, then you just do it for your own mental sake. But th it becomes more your decision and, and no one else's. Mm -hmm. How about a student question? Go ahead. That's a great question. You can tell me the answer hopefully someday. <laughs> I, I think Kelly's comment about having other things in your life are really important. Um, and it kind of goes back to Jerry's question about, you know, what do you learn here at the lab? Or what did, what did I learn at the lab that, that, that transcended my experience here? And that's that, you know, I've had jobs where you work a, an hourly wage doing whatever. I mean, I was a, bar, I was a waiter down in, in Bar Harbor one of the summers I was here. You know, there, I think, to the earlier points, you have, you're, you're engaged in something for a fixed amount of time, and at the end of it, you go home. Um, if you're in a research capacity, there is always something you, more you could be doing. And I think, um, I guess, get, having the internal uh, decision-making uh, process to say, you know, today I'm going to stop doing this, or I'm going to create a pattern of behavior where I tackle, you know, my problem, uh, whether it's academic course load or, or, or uh, lab time, you know, I'm going to carve out this amount of time and then I might let it bleed a little bit on the ends, but I'm still going to stick to that and then I'm going to go pursue other things that are completely counter. Um, and I think the, the earlier comment about how that's when you do your best thinking, 
Um, I think that's, a, I mean, I walk to and from work. I live in Manhattan. I walk to and from work. It's about 25 minutes. I think of a, a, lot, of, a lot of what I end up uh, pursuing sometimes on a given day is something I've thought about on the walk to work, um, just letting my mind wander about things. So um, having those breaks is really important, having other things. Um, that's not to say you won't go through lulls. I mean, you guys talked about lulls you had in, in grad school. You can have those in college. I had those. I also was plagued by indecision about what I wanted to do, and I think then the inferiority elements or the, the imposter elements start to take hold, too, and I think you've got to put those things at bay and say, lots of people go through that. It's entirely normal. Um, and I think once you recognize that you're experiencing something that is experienced by lots of people and there's nothing wrong with it, um, and then you can harness and say, well, now, you know, now that I know that about myself and now that I know that about sort of the natural progression and maturation of you know, academic life or career, you know, what am I going to do about it? I think that's really, coming to those base understandings I think is really important. A lot of people think that I think life's just going to naturally, in a linear pattern, work out for them, and it, it doesn't work that way for anybody. I think, um, I think one reason why, especially you get the, the senior year slump, uh, who, if you guys are juniors, you'll experience that, but in your senior year of undergrad, you're going to get to like well, March, and you'll be very kind of burned out. You'll be wanting to be done. Um, and I think it's because you're still riding on the rails that you have certain expectations that you need to fulfill. Um, in grad school, you, if you're really super organized and you have like your paper planned out down to the experiment, and it's like, yeah, I, don't, I need to do this assay. Tomorrow, when you have everything planned out hour by hour, you might be a little bit kind of running on rails, but it's, uh, science is as much of a creative enterprise as any other job I've ever experienced. Um, and I think that the ability to take research in a new and novel direction and the ability to exert some level of control over a topic you're fundamentally interested in uh, is what keeps things kind of fresh. Um, if you're also fortunate enough to have a supportive mentor that allows you to do little side projects, um, those are passion projects that if you have an incubation for four hours or your mice are sitting for two weeks, um, you do that in the meantime. You, that's something that your advisor may have no expertise in, um, and, but that's something that you will take control of. Um, and because you're the driving force, it's likely going to be something you're fundamentally interested in. Uh, and I think that when you're doing something that you um, have chosen and selected in, it's your research baby, uh, that is something that I think it's buffers that burnout feeling. Um, and again, repeating, you know, go out, join a softball team, go play kickball or something. You know, grad school's not all lab work. You can do uh, real life things. So kickball, I guess, is a real life, but it's pretty fun. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, I'll echo everything these guys said. Um, and also, when I was looking for graduate schools, I really wanted to be sure, like my big question when I went to every interview was, how much of a life do you have? Like, what, what have you created here? Because um, at least in my experience, a little bit different in graduate school, I, I didn't really have as much creative freedom, so I needed to find freshness and excitement in other parts of my life. Um, but you know, when I went for my graduate school interviews, I would always ask the same question wherever I went to graduate students just to see the answers. And um, I kind of wanted that happy medium. Some schools that I went to said, oh, you have no life. You, you, you do nothing but research all the time. Um, and then other schools I went to, uh, there was a particular school in Colorado I went to that was like, oh yeah, we just take off and go skiing all the time, no one bothers us. And I was like, well, how long does it take you to get your PhD? And they're like, oh, seven to eight years. I was like, no, thank you. So, um, so I tried to find this like happy medium and at least for me, um, Princeton was a good choice because everyone said, you know, they let you have a nice life generally from, with, among the different PIs. And for me, that was where I was from. So my whole family was there and I really found solace and, and comfort in being with my family during graduate school. So, you know, I, I found sort of the reducing burnout was from other things in my life, not necessarily the work. Alex, go ahead. Tangent off of that, and I'll go right back to it. But it, 
if you're battling with a decision for grad school, take some time and figure it out. So I'm in my fifth year, I'm about a year away from graduating, maybe. Um, it's the US Biomedical Research Track takes a while. Um, you really want to know that this is what you want to do. And if you don't, that's fine. This is your life, your career prerogative. You should be feel empowered that it's your, um, your choice to make. And so take time, do a post-baccalaureate program, uh, work as a lab technician. Um, don't do the, I'm gonna go to grad school because I don't know what to do, because that's a bad choice. Mm -hmm. I will fundamentally say that's a really bad choice. Um, and, because that's actually when burnout will start kicking in. Um, if I could go back to my younger self, uh, I think it would be to more aggressively ask questions. Uh, when I, so, as Kelly mentioned, uh, one of the most important and fundamental parts of when you get to grad school or when you are interviewing for grad school is I'll ask a lot of questions. See, is this the right fit for you? Um, what are the expectations for your grad work? I've been very fortunate with having great mentors, and so it's, you know, I've come up, I feel like I've bumbled my way and they've kind of kicked me back in the right direction. Uh, but being able to say, no, I don't know if this is right for me, um, I am still wondering, you know, is this the right choice? Like, can you help me make that? Uh, give me more information. I think that's, the, that's what I would tell my younger self. I, I would totally agree with that. We were talking about this before that, you know, if we were to both go back to your position now, we would take off time between undergraduate and grad school. Grad school. You know, there's, there's so much going on in your senior life right now that, you know, you're just thinking about the next step, but you need some time to breathe before you enter into a five to six year program studying one topic. You need to make sure that that's actually, you know, what you love and what you want to pursue. Um, the other thing is, uh, I got a piece of advice from one of my uh, mentors in undergrad right before I was making all these big decisions. And she had told me, and I think it's great advice, um, to just go with your gut. You know, you, you've made it this far. You've, you've ended up here at MDIBL. I'm sure you're doing great in your studies in undergraduate. And so it's time to start, stop thinking with your brain so much on these big decisions and just go with who you are and what feels right. You know, no matter what choice you make that comes next, it's going to be a good choice. You know, you, you've, you've built up this whole resume behind you. So whatever, whatever is coming, it's probably going to be good, but you have to make a decision about where you want your life to go. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Maybe um, we've heard a lot about grad schools and higher education. What about uh, high school, I mean, you know, grad schools and so forth. What about the high school students? I'm curious if any of the high school students have questions. Any of you guys? They've been there. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, hard to think back that way. Okay, well, how about this one? Um, surprises. Has there been anything that has really come as a shock to you, something that's really surprised you along the way? You mentioned bumbling through things that you didn't foresee, perhaps, but something that you might be able to help these guys think about, a real surprise that happened, and then um, basically, based upon that, do you think you would have changed any of your path because of surprises. If you guys don't have surprises, whew, you're well, good. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start for the high school students at least. Um, when I was in high school, our biology program was awful. I hated biology. I basically hated all of science. Chemistry was boring. You know, I, I wanted nothing to do with it. So um, I had joined the debate team. I was on the newspaper. I was John Kerry for our school's mock election. Like I was like big time into politics and law. Um, and so that's what I intended to go to undergraduate and do. I wanted to be a lawyer afterwards. Um, so, but when I got to college, you know, I started taking political science courses. I realized maybe I'm not as good as my other friends in this field, you know, whatever. But that's not what you should judge yourself on. Um, but it took until I took one biology course my freshman year as a distribution requirement. I was like, I'll just get this over with. And that one course and that one wonderful professor just totally changed my perspective and brought me back to you know the thing I love most, which was science. Science is always, and biology had always been a part of my home and family life. Um, and that one class, for some reason, just went, oh, th this is what I'm supposed to do. 
Um, and I found myself doing both biology and law classes for a little while in undergraduate. Um, and I ended up sitting in my political science courses going, what am I doing here? I just want to be in the lab. You know, it, it, you, you find yourself throughout, throughout undergraduate. So if right now you're thinking biology and you stick with it, that's great. That's awesome. I'm glad you're so passionate about it. But, you know, this is not the end. You could drastically change your vision as you go through um, undergraduate. And, you know, even though you love science, turn out being a financial manager. So... It's actually funny you say that because I at Brewer High they had a pretty advanced, you know, pretty robust uh, AP placement uh, program. So I, I remember I did AP Bio and Chem and Physics, and I thought science was where I wanted to be. Um, and then exactly the opposite thing happened to me that happened to you. I, you know, I started taking philosophy courses and polit political science courses, and, and realized that I, I enjoyed those much more. It took some convincing, I think. When you have this view of yourself, it takes some some it takes repeated evidence to the contrary to make you wake up to the fact that maybe you know you you aren't who you thought you were or your interests aren't what you thought they were. Um, so it's kind of funny, Kelly. Exactly the opposite thing happened with me. And I think maybe the takeaway for that is the role that you know luck plays in life, luck and timing. Um, you know, I think having a broad plan as to what you want to accomplish is is definitely worthwhile. But then understanding that. As things come along, you know the view you have of yourself, what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, um, and then the right opportunity might float in front of you at the right time, and, and you're willing to, to latch onto it. So, um, I think being adaptable maybe is is the takeaway from that perspective. Do you, there's a question in the back. Do you want to? Yeah. Is it on something we're saying or? It helped me rule out that I did not want to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, honest to God, this is something I talked at length with my brother about, you know, the fact that, let's just say, and I know these people, I, I went to school with a lot of them um, at Penn, was that they came in day one having taken science courses in high school and said, and I don't know if this was due to parental pressure or whatever, saying, I'm going to be a physician. And if you make that decision at that point, uh, a lot of those folks go directly from undergrad to, to medical school and then into multi-year residency programs. And what I didn't, I guess what made me uncomfortable is it looked like there was some pretty big upheaval coming in terms of how hospitals were organized, how doctors functioned on a daily basis. You know, private practice was going away. You were becoming part of hospital, you know, direct hospital employees. Um, and I didn't know if it was, I was not passionate enough, I guess I'll say it this way. I wasn't passionate enough about that as a career path to say, if I'm not going to roll out into an independent functioning physician for 12 or 15 years, I, d I know myself well enough to know that I'm not going to be committed to it if there's some upheaval with how medicine is run that occurs over that time frame that's adverse to me. Um, and my, my brother Mike talks about this in terms of his medical school class and his residency program, that there are people there he, who he thinks are there for the wrong reason. Um, that if, if um, if the finances weren't still, you know, favorable, um, that they wouldn't be there. They're not really in it for, he doesn't think, the right reasons. And so I guess it's not exactly an answer to your question about did I see some convergence that led me into, you know, a promised land? No, but I saw something that I thought were significant risk factors to, you know, to something, and I knew I wasn't committed enough to, where, to weather that, you know, any change in that viewpoint. Well, so. what are you saying? Well, I think that's important, yeah, and that's, that goes back to adaptability. You know, I, I, I started with a viewpoint that that's what I wanted to do, and then the more I thought about it and those risk factors, and then actually really enjoying the poli sci and the philosophy courses I was taking, I could say, you know what, and it was, and it was, it was kind of an emotional weight off my shoulders when I made that decision. You know, I think if you open up your mind to say, and this was, I changed, you know, in my current career, I changed employers. 
And, and when I first joined my first employer right out of school, I felt like, you know, I, I enjoyed the team, I enjoyed the work, I thought, man, I could be here for 40 years. And things didn't, at some point, didn't go well. You know, we had the financial crisis in 08 and 09, and I, and I woke up to the fact that, you know, maybe there's a better role for me somewhere else, and it was very liberating. Once I let my mind say, you know, this isn't the, I don't owe these people anything. You know, I have to make a life for myself, and there's, you know, it's an emotional tie, I think, for me to say, I don't have, you know, I can, I can entertain other ideas. Both of those instances, I think, were, you know, I guess, in your mind, uh, eliminating options. I think that's as important as figuring it out is to eliminate some of these side options you have. I don't know what you guys would say. In the back there? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, my wife Devin knows I'm, I'm very scared to get in the water these days, the ocean water, because you know I'm probably personally responsible for the lives of five or six hundred sharks. So I feel like that they have my number, um, but I don't want to. I don't want to hog all the time. Um, I mean, in terms of being open to the mindset of of what you're doing, my you know I think we're all lucky in that our current jobs allow us a, a lot of flexibility. You know, I know. So I graduated. Uh, nine years ago from, from college, and so I have a lot of friends who, frankly, are not that happy doing what they're doing. And they're, they're, I think the limiting factor for them is that they're in roles that don't allow them a whole lot of flexibility. Um, I mean, uh, in my day-to-day, -day, I, I get to interact with a lot of people, defend our positions we've taken from an investment uh, view. Um, very smart people asking very tough questions. It's an engaging environment, but it's also dynamic in the sense that you know, the stock market's moving around, commodity prices are moving around, company evaluations are moving around, and I can, there's a lot of flexibility, there's a lot of, to this gentleman's point about reading things and being engaged to things that are totally removed from my narrow universe, there might be a great read through that somebody else hasn't made. Um, that, that for me is what makes my job really, really exciting. Um, I guess in terms of lab experience that helped with that, I think having multiple summers in the same lab and seeing the transfer of work from one period to the next, either ruling things out or opening up whole new avenues of thought, that was really interesting. We also, I don't know how the lab is run today, but 
we had national public radio running the whole time. I didn't grow up, you know, I, my dad listened to NPR, but it wasn't something that me, you know, me and my own time listened to. Now I'm a huge fan of their podcast. But we had this, um, it was an alarm clock radio. It's probably still there. It's, it was, it, it predated me, I'll say that. And I think it was only, it would only catch the local NPR station. And there was this great tradition in our laboratory, and I, sometimes if I catch the timing right, I'll think about it. So at, at 8.55 a.m., uh, there was this Garrison Keillor thing, uh, Writer's Almanac. And if, if this is still a kidney shed thing, then the people will know. And we would cease whatever we were doing at that point, and Dr. Silver and Dr. Epstein would sit around, and, and Garrison Keillor would read his little thing about the Writer's Almanac. And then it would always end with this phrase, um, be well, uh, do good work, and keep in touch. And then they would, we would all turn back around to whatever we were doing and get to work. Um, but what filters through the radio all day, if you're not listening to music, if you're listening to people engaging in thought ideas, that would spur a discussion that was way outside of what we were doing in the laboratory. Um, and I feel like that was also an important lesson to sort of have your ears and eyes open to things that were way removed from what we were doing, but could at some point filter back on how we thought about something. Um, so that was really important. Uh, so I would say um, being able to advocate for yourself and your own interests, that helps. I would say that that correlates with openness. If you're willing to recognize that you have a right to say what you're interested in and then accept that and say, okay, I don't care what my classmates say, my parents may be disappointed, but this is what I'm truly passionate about. Um, and advocate that you, advocate for what you need to uh, experience and be trained in to go down that career path. I think that is absolutely necessary and critical. Um, and I don't think that that's with what Chris mentioned about the, the, the weight off the shoulders once you find your inspiration. I can completely vouch for that. It is a, a liberating, freeing experience that um, when you have an idea of what you know you want to do, and that may change. You, you can pivot later in life as you kind of figure out uh, new career paths um, and new, new decisions you're making every day. Um, but I think the fundamental thing is that you need to be able to say, this is what I'm interested in. Don't, you don't want to be kind of flaky and continually back, bounce back and forth every day. But if you are truly passionate about something, um, you need to be okay with saying, I'm going to go on this path and I, I will uh, seek out the training needed for that. Uh, and for me, um, when I was at uh, Bowdoin in Hadley's lab, um, one thing that we had access to was her confocal microscope. And I had never done much microscopy except for like, my parents had me, uh, gave me like one of the mirror microscopes when I was like five or something. Um, and so I never used like a big pro microscope with like lasers and filters. Um, and that was, just, it was amazing. And at the lab I'm in now at University of Rochester, we do multi-photon intravital microscopy. And it's just, it's something I find infinitely interesting. It's so exciting to work on every day. Um, but to do that, I had to, I was initially um, a biological engineering major at UMaine, and I really hated steam tables. I don't know if everybody has ever looked at process engineering. It, I was not a fan. People can be super passionate about steam tables, that's fine. Um, but I really stayed in that major far too long for my own good. I waited until my junior year, and then finally I said, nope. I took an abnormal psychology class, loved it, and then all of a sudden I really started liking uh, psychology, neuroscience, that's what's led me down my career path. Career, I'm still in grad school, so it's a short path. But that's, I, I'd say, but I, I had to take that step to say, okay, I know this is what I'm interested in, and so I need to switch my major or at least get additional classes uh, to go down that career path. So. Um, in terms of uh, flexibility, gaining the, the ability to be flexible, you know, it definitely started here at MDIBL and grew in my time at graduate school. Um, I find myself to be very opinionated and um, what I say goes. Um, but being here and looking at the same data set as the person next to me is and hearing a totally different opinion about what that means, where you go from there, it really has helped me over the year to be more accepting of ideas that are different than mine. Um, and I feel like that's hugely important in my career now in education because, you know, I have certain opinions about the way, you know, education should be done, the way things should be taught, but there's a world of different ways to do it out there. And so when someone approaches me with an idea, 
I know to tell myself to stop being defensive and take it in and think about it for a little while and see the value in that idea and try to maybe integrate it into what I'm doing. So um, it has really taught me to, to be flexible with the people around me. Um, and I think that's hugely valuable now. We have about five more minutes left before we should head to the cocktail hour. So why don't we, um, or maybe closer to 10, so we could have a couple more questions if anybody has any. Alan, you've got one? the fact that I knew absolutely nothing about the topic I was studying. Uh, be, you know, because if you're a top student in high school, then you tend to go and you start to advocate for yourself and start picking out uh, labs that you want to work in. And you know, you're, if you've always kind of been um, a bit of a go-getter, um, a lot of times for like high school classes, it's a minimal, very broad set of information that you can kind of master. Um, I, you know, studying for high school tests is a bit easier than studying for college tests. Um, and so I think that you kind of get this idea that, oh, I'm just good at biology. And then you're confronted with an entirely different field when someone will tell you, no, that's completely wrong. Why would you think that? Um, and I think that being able to recognize, I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I can try to find out. Um, I think that was a big turning point. Um, so I guess a little bit of a loss of hubris. Um, so that would be my, that was my, my transition. Yeah, I think understanding, being comfortable with discomfort. Um, you know, I don't know if they still do the morning uh, presentations like down on the yeah. point, but I would go to, I would, I would understand 5% of what was being said. Um, and I would look around worried that maybe I was the only one uh, that that was true for. And obviously over the course of, of a couple of summers that, that ceased to be true. I maybe worked up to 10 or 15% or whatever. Um, but I think understanding that, that that's natural, um, and understanding that um, you know there are really great mentors to, to lean on. I think I was early on. This is probably still something I struggle with. I'm always concerned with coming across. This, you know, I don't want to seem like um, I'm bothering that other person. I don't want to seem like I'm you know too needy, too picky. I also um, I feel like I need to know enough about something before I ask a question about it. Um, and so I think that experience at the laboratory helped me to say, you know, I don't think anybody else sitting shoulder to shoulder with me is, is experiencing something wildly different than what I'm experiencing. So it's okay to go out there and ask this. Um, and, you know, my current job, you know, the companies I cover, they report earnings four times a year. And so they'll open, the CEO will sit there and, and have a conference call with analysts to inquire about how the business is going. And I don't think for the first two years I was asking any questions on those calls because I was worried, you know, other people are going to hear this, right? There's a transcript of this. It's available, you know. If I come across sounding really stupid, that's, a, you know, that's going to shoot myself in the foot. Um, so I think getting comfort with discomfort was something I learned uh, here at the lab that maybe I needed more work on in college and I got it there. But um, it, it was a starting measure to, to feel like... Um, there's a normalizing element that people introduced to a new concept naturally know nothing about it when they start. And so that's okay. It's not a specific skill set necessarily, but it's, I think, a, a philosophy on life that was pervasive here and I, I wholeheartedly agree with now. Jerry? So that was something that, that was like one of the big surprises, though one of the questions earlier. Um, so I went to grad school thinking, I'm just gonna go to grad school, I'll get a postdoc, I'll be a professor, I'll be, you know, that'll be happy-go-lucky times. Um, right now, something like 10 to 14% of all grad students across the globe will become a tenure-track faculty member, and under 10% will actually attain that level. And so it's like the look around the room, pick out 10 people, nine of those won't get that job. And so it's really, 
it's kind of frightening, uh, but it's a, an important and realistic thing you need to actually understand. Um, I think that uh, it's a little bit sobering. Um, I was telling Kelly that my boss uh, applied for a Department of Defense grant, uh, and he, the grant that he got it, but he was in, the top, um, it, they only funded the top three and a half percent of grants, and so the 96.5% that were below that didn't get that. Um, so you can either be, look at it as like, I'm not gonna survive, um, or you can look at it realistically and say, if I want this, I know I have to work really hard. Um, and I have a lot of friends in grad school who are now coming in and they are not gonna do the academic career path because one, they might've found something they're really passionate about, science outreach, science education, uh, government work, that's, and it's really exciting to see very talented people going after those careers because that means that um, the general population will benefit even more because I trust what they say and so I know we'll be okay on those fields. Um, but I think that it's, it's given me um, a more humble opinion of like what, um, it's not gonna be a, 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 an immediate get for me to go for a career, uh, academic career path, um, but that's important. So for me in my last couple years and trying to decide where I was going next, it was really two opposites. I either wanted to do education or I'm really passionate about wildlife genetics. So it's two very opposite things. So I had gone to a conference uh, in the middle of my fifth year and I had lunches with a whole bunch of PIs like saying I love your work, like how can I get involved, can I be a postdoc, do you have positions? And it was just for, for the subject that I was interested in, there was just no money. And it, like they didn't have money coming in and if I wanted to be a postdoc, that meant I had to apply for my own grants, which might, might, meant it might be another year and a half before I even have a yes or no answer as to whether or not I can go into that lab. Um, so not to discourage you guys from you know, pursuing what you wanna do, um, but you know, that really, made my decision as, as, to, as to where I was gonna go as for my first step after grad school. I don't see that not being a part of maybe a future career. I would love to have some of that uh, built into also education. Um, but at least for now, that sort of put me more so on the education track than staying in the research track. Note, though. I so know. Ask a weird can I, can I, can I offer a piece yeah, of not, advice? We're not done yet. Go yeah. ahead, Kelly. Okay. Ahead. Um, my piece of advice for you guys is keep in touch. That's that's the biggest thing I think that has been most beneficial in me finding a career and maintaining friendships. Uh, one of my very best girlfriends, who I met here in the summer of 2008, just got married this past weekend, and I was a bridesmaid. So. You know, even though we've lived long distance, uh, she went to her PhD program at Vanderbilt in Nashville and I was in Princeton. Um, we've remained best friends all of these years. Um, so that's one really great thing. But the other thing is too, is that by keeping in touch with the folks here, Jerry and uh, my current boss over at Jax, Charlie, he used to be uh, the education director here. Um, that really helped me get started in my life here. Charlie offered me a job and Jerry offered me her in-laws apartment. So, um, you know, keeping in touch with these guys has really been able to bring my life sort of full circle and, and get back to the place that I love. Yeah, networking. <clears throat> networking is mm -hmm. a huge part of success. A lot of people who are very successful will tell you that it wasn't that job that they pursued and pursued and pursued and the next job. It was that people knew about them and they found out and they're the great find the more you put yourself out there. Yeah, don't be afraid to use the it's who you know kind of thing. It, it mm -hmm. really is who you know. <laughs> so are there any last questions? If not, I think we will convene to the cocktail hour where everyone will be available. Thank you guys, thank you very much.